I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Deborah Tabart, OAM CEO of the Australian Koala Foundation. Fondly known as the Koala Woman, she's been at her post since February 1988. At that time, she was told to raise $5 million and, quote, save the koala, end quote. Since that time, she has focused her attention on mapping koala habitat. If you cannot save a habitat, you will never save any species. Truer words were never spoken. The AKF takes no government funding and has over the years spoken more and more confidently about the plight of the koala. The AKF scientifically estimates there are between 50,000 and 100,000 koalas in the wild remaining. Deborah believes that the lower number is the accurate figure. Between 1890 and 1927, the AKF has found manifest for 8 million koala skins, which were sold in the New York and London fur market. So first, thank you for your excellent work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you for having me. I love being back. Thank you. Thank you. So if, if it's okay, I would like to start with sort of a 10-minute uh, overview of koalas and an introduction to the threats against them and then move on to some very specific threats that are happening right now. Yes, Derek. Um, look, when I got my job in 1988, the board asked me to raise $5 million so that we could fund universities. And at that time, the young veterinary uh, scientists were very concerned about the role that chlamydia played in um, declines. Now, we became the largest funding body of chlamydia research, but then all of a sudden you realised, well, why is this uh, increasing? And because chlamydia has been part of many species' um, natural disease process, but you could see that it was going up and then you suddenly realise, look, you get sick when you're starving to death and and then at the same time the phone started ringing and people were going, you know, you have to help us, you're the Australian Koala Foundation, you have to come and stop the bulldozers that are knocking down habitats. And so that really began, you know, my career really. I started getting in the car and driving to all these places and so in my 30-year career now, I have driven probably the, <laughs> about one and a half million square kilometres, um, which is like, I don't know how many miles, but it's a heck of a lot. And it's like from Alaska to San Diego, you know, it's a huge distance. And, and in each part of the country, you would see a different problem. And the koala was sort of like a jigsaw piece in a majorly flawed puzzle. And I started to realise, unless you really understand, <clears throat> you know, is this really a koala problem? Is this really a koala forest? So that began my foray into mapping, and we've been mapping now since 1989, because unless you've got decent maps, you can never solve anything. And so by and large, one of the first mappers that um, <clears throat> worked for us way back in 1992 or three, he came in the other day and he saw our maps because we pretty much finished the whole east coast of Australia and he burst into tears because, you know, he was so much part of that that vision we had then and now we're pretty much finished. So it's an astounding amount of work and the team that I've had over these years is staggering. And so when you cut your tree down, then you have to move. Half the time you get killed by a car or a dog gets you or you starve to death or you are so weak that you get sick. And many years ago, our creative director came up with a slogan for us, which was no tree, no me. And now that 85% of the world's forests have been cleared, that is more true than ever, even for the human species. It just beggars belief to me that people don't get, if you keep continuing to destroy a habitat, you will end, end up with nothing, just concrete, and nothing can live in concrete. So. Um, it's been a fascinating, you know, 30 years really because every day you go to work there's another conundrum, absolutely every day. 
someone will ring and say this is happening and it might even be a piece of habitat that we used to think was formally safe and all of a sudden either the developers or industry is after it. And sadly I have just watched laws diminish. We've had Senate inquiries, we've had reports, governments constantly ask us for advice but they never take it. So my frustration levels are high but my dedication to get uh, a piece of legislation which is going to protect the koala, which is a Koala Protection Act, is greater than ever. So I'm delighted to be speaking to your listeners. So before we talk about either the, the, the threats that caused me to write you recently or, or the, what was it, the Save the Koala Act? Yeah, a Koala Protection Act. Koala Protection Act. Before we talk about either of those, um, can you can you continue a little bit more with a quick overview of uh, perhaps um, a a range and number for koalas, say two hundred years ago, a and a range thirty years ago, and a range now. Yes. Okay. Well, when I got the job, no one really knew, and so it became a massive exercise, and again, where the maps are so important, because you can say, well, how, how much habitat was there? So we have pre-clearing maps from historical records, and the only way we can really have some indication is that we now know, as you said in your intro, between 1890 and 1927, we have the manifest for eight million skins that were shot for fur that went to London and New York. So that's a massive number and over a very short time. And Australia has only been settled for about 200 years. We have the largest extinction rate in the world and it's because we have just attacked those forests, you know, unbelievably. Sometimes I go into forests and you see them and they cut these massive trees down with just, you know, long saws and bullet drays. I mean, the history of this country is amazing, as the same as America and, and like any other beautiful country in the world. Um, so we now say that there's anywhere between 50 and 100,000, but I personally think it's in that lower range. And we now have seen localised extinctions and even one of our governments recently has admitted that the koala population is functionally extinct, which means basically beyond recovery. So I think the koala's in decline. I think there is nothing to stop it going to extinction. And I see legislation being constantly watered down. So um, I try these days not to even talk about numbers because once you're on the endangered species list, surely that's a sign that says, I'm in trouble, I need help. But really what I see is governments, including IUCN and other things, um, just playing around with the figures, you know, fiddling while Rome burns, and that just sends me into apoplexy. I mean, I can be a very unpleasant person when the bureaucrats get at me. <laughs> well, good. Good. <laughs> Yes, I hope that explains, but like every species on this planet, the koala's in trouble, absolutely in trouble. And I think the people who support our foundation know that. I think the average Australian knows that. But I think the politicians are living in some sort of la-la land about as long as we've got them in zoos, um, everything will be OK. And you and I both know, especially after your book about zoos, you and I both know that's nonsense. So so the the... The uh, catalyst for me writing to request this particular interview was an article headlined, Ackland Coal Mine, Josh Frydenberg Gives Approval to $900 Million Expansion. So mm -hmm. um, I wrote to you to see if you'd like to talk about that. And you said, well, there's that, plus there are two other huge coal mines. Um, mm -hmm. So can you can you... Talk about yes. um, those particular coal mines. Yes. Well, I want to try and paint a picture for your listeners about what Australia looks like. So it's the, the same land mass as the size of the United States, and our eastern forests are, are sort of almost exactly the same landscape as, as your west coast. And 
there is a great dividing range, which is like the Rocky Mountains. So on the east of the dividing range is where mainly the fertile soil is because Australia only has about 6% of its land that's arable. The rest is desert and 80% of the aquila forests have gone. So again, when I got my job, it never occurred to me that the koalas on the west of the Great Dividing Range would be, you know, like over the top of the Rocky Mountains because it was mainly farmlands and river systems and, and whatever that they would be at risk. But what has been the saddest thing is that the East Coast, and, and bear in mind that we only have 24 million people over that landscape. It is, and that's why I still feel that the koalas save, could be saved and that we could be a role model to so many developing nations. If you get your planning right, you can have your urban expansion, but you can also keep your wildlife. Um, I never have thought that I would ever have to fight battles on the west of the divide. But the coal now, the coal mining across our country is just staggering. And I've had some very big grown-up lessons in the last few years because in, the, in 2011 there was a Senate inquiry that looked at, you know, what was happening to the koalas. And certainly the developers with their, um, you know, amalgamated council they basically said, we are not interested in protecting this koala. And, of course, you can understand why, because pretty much every part of the east coast of Australia has got koala habitat on it. So it, it could affect a $3 billion industry every year for the next 20 years. So they don't want that. But the Senate report at the federal government level said that the states, three of them, are incapable of protecting the koalas, and it was recommended it was protected. Now, what I realise now is that during the deliberation of those decisions, pretty much every coal mine in koala habitat was given what they call a, a controlled action, which basically says, yep, no worries, you can build this mine, we'll give you your environmental constraints after the fact. And, and I had, because they delayed the listing for something like two years, and we constantly put pressure on them. Why aren't you making this decision? Why are you withholding? And it wasn't until you started to see the approval of these coal mines come out that you suddenly thought they didn't want a constraint of koala habitat. So since uh, researching for this interview, I can say that there's probably seven coal mines that now fit into that. And the one of them will have something like... 5,000 tonnes a day coming out of it. I mean, the stat figures are staggering. And when I was in Copenhagen at Climate Talks in 2009, I remember having to sort of learn the process of if this amount of coal comes out of the ground, you know, we will go to, you know, 350 parts per million and that will bring our temperatures up 2 degrees. Now here in Australia where I live, we have had 40 degrees for the last, uh, 40 degrees Celsius for the last week. And in Sydney, in an, the other state, they've had like 44s and 45s and one place even got to 49 in the, in the bush. So we're starting to see increasing temperatures. And um, so last year I went to America in April to start getting training on coal mines because I suddenly realised if I don't understand why the imperative to, to get this coal out of the ground, I will never be able to have any say in whether or not, you know, koala habitat is going to be destroyed. And in some of these coal mines, the areas are enormous. And perhaps I can just share with your listeners some of the things that I've learned along the way. In Ackland, for instance, the coal mine used to be underground, so I can actually go and sit in a little park in a little town called Ackland, and there's one man there called Glenn Butel, and he has refused to sell. <clears throat> and so the, the town was basically bought up by government because the coal was under the ground. And it is, it's the weirdest feeling to drive into a town where everything's just been taken away, but Glenn is still there. And, and he takes photos of all the koalas. And I basically never go into any place unless there are koalas. 
And here I was sitting in this little park with him and I was looking down and there's the big colliery, you know, the big wheel that brings up the coal and everything. And, and I realised that in the 1920s we dug the coal from under the ground and you still had your um, pasture on the top. So in a way those pasture industries and koalas could coexist with mining. But now it's long wall mining and you strip it. And and that's because everybody doesn't want to, it's cheaper to just blow it all up. And then now we've been around long enough that we've got these huge holes in the ground and there is an imposition on these companies to supposedly fill it back in and create what was there before. But I do not believe there's one coal mine in Australia that's done that. They tend to just, you know, disband the company and move on. So I could bore your listeners to death with the fact that it is just a crash and burn. You come in, you dig it up, you sell it and you get out. And I find that so disturbing and, and at the moment it's rapacious. So you said seven mines. Can you... Um can you give, and you also said, I think you used the word big or huge or large. Can you, mm-hmm. can you talk about the size of some of these um, strip mines? I think, I don't want to exaggerate here, Darren, Derek, but I honestly think one of them is going to be like 100 kilometers long, which is like 50 miles long. Um, and I have to be very careful because these companies are very, very anxious about anyone who says anything against them. And what we're finding now more and more is that anyone who speaks out against those companies, the government, especially the conservative government, has started to sort of instigate um, greater um, impositions on freedom of speech and also quite a few activists have been jailed and have got seven-year jail terms. Um, one mine that I went to a couple of years ago and was actually in a vehicle on a public road and in a national park because one of the mines is going to affect an Aboriginal site which has a thing called grinding grooves. and. Um, I'd never seen one until I'd been to this site, but it's actually a 10,000-year-old site where the Aboriginal people used to grind their spears. And some of your listeners may know, but Australian Aborigines have been here for around about 60,000 years. And when you think of Stonehenge being 5,000 years old, and here you are looking at a stone that was used by man 10,000 years ago, and I've even met some Aboriginal people who've got... um, 20,000 year old oral stories and that someone's just going to blow it up and there are lots of videos about the grinding grooves if anyone wants to go on the web but what I found was that you know the security guards from the mines actually you know travel alongside you and sort of you know try to intimidate and um, you know one security guard stopped me and, and I have an OAM which is an Order of Australia medal which is, you know, like in Amer- in England, they call them OBEs. So I was sort of took on my posh voice and said, Do you, how dare you stop me? This is a public road. And I actually wrote to the chairman of that company and said, I expect an apology for being stopped on a private road or being allowed to go into a national park. So the reason I'm telling this story is because the power of the mining companies is growing. And recently our Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, did actually announce now that he's Prime Minister, that he believes in clean coal. And, and, and again, in preparation for this interview, I did actually have an economist try and educate me about the economics of all this, Darren and Derek. And it's just so shocking to me that it's just all smoke and mirrors. If you really cast your eyes over it, you can just see it's about we have to produce um, industry. We have to make sure industry is happy because they politically donate to us. And it seems to me that all our politicians in Canberra just must be in air conditioning because they're not feeling how hot it is. I mean, my home isn't air conditioned. I live in the bush and the last five days have been unbearable. So let's go back to where you said that it was um, 100 kilometres long 
and mm -hmm. we, won't, we won't hold you to that. And you, you said, you know, you put all sorts of caveats around that. But, but what we can gather from that and what, what is easy to say is that these, these mines are bigger than a football field. I mean, these, these, oh my. Yeah, I mean, these are, oh, yeah. these are, these are not, these are not insignificant destruction of forests. These are, these are destructions not of one small patch of ground, which would be in itself a tragedy. But instead, these are, when you say massive, you mean massive. I mean massive. And, and, yeah, oh, I mean massive. And also this massive in infrastructure that's going in as well. I mean, people can Google um, the fight against Abbott Point, which is a coal mine terminal which exports uh, around the world. And that is right on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef. So Greenpeace and others are fighting so hard uh, to, to stop the, the, um, the expansion of that port. Because if you've got more coal mines from, if you've got more coal from more coal mines, then you have to build bigger trains, bigger railway lines, and bigger ports to export. And again, I haven't got uh, the figures of the number of coal. Uh, ships that are going through the Great Barrier Reef. The Greenpeace basically says it's only a matter of time before there'll be a major big spill of coal going over the reef. And and I believe that. You know, I don't I just trust that my environmental colleagues are telling me the truth. <clears throat> what I find so sad is that people somehow or other think, well, that's my kid's job, you know. If I say these things in Australia, people go, well, where do you think the jobs are going to come from? And I believe that Australia has the only way for Australia to proceed is renewables. And right now we have this enormous debate between renewables and, and coal. So the politicians are saying you can have clean coal. And Derek, if it wasn't so funny, you'd have to laugh. But we had this massive storm in South Australia and all the existing electricity um, towers were knocked over by this sort of cyclonic winds and they're blaming the renewable energy industry for that and so it's like the emperor's new clothes you know the, the politicians go you know well it's disgusting we're relying on renewables and now the system is blown over and you think that you know this is not right and so i do find it harder and harder these days to articulate the solutions to people and and I did think very <clears throat> hard about what to say to your listeners and that is we have to conserve every single bit of energy that we use as, as us. I had some Americans staying at my home recently and I could see that they had no idea of how much energy they use and my family and my in my world fans have to be turned off we do not have air conditioning we put our clothes out on the line and certainly i live in a warm climate but it can get cold and i appreciate that, you know people can freeze to death in 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 the northern parts of america and other parts of the world and i understand energy is important but if we waste energy then we are going to accelerate the speed on which the climate change is happening and I see that every day in my job. So again, I never thought I'd have to do an interview like this. Um, you know, I thought I would always have to talk about koalas, but I have to learn, and which is why I still love going to work every day, I have to learn the threats to the koalas and at some level have um, a solution to that because I do not believe it's fair that one industry wins over another. And I recently wrote to the Prime Minister, um, the koala brings $3 billion a year in tourist dollars. People come here to see them, want to see them in the wild, buy, buy koala you know, stuffed toys and T-shirts and all that. Are you really prepared to give that up for a massive hole in the ground that will never be filled and, and could cook our planet? But that just cannot resonate with our current political leadership. So, when you when you talk about the the coal mines, you have been, um, you know, we've we've talked a little bit about the effects of the coal on global warming, which we can talk about more mm -hmm. if you want. Um, but in addition, can we just underscore the fact that if you have a huge hole in the ground? that was until very recently a forest, what you've done is 
destroyed all that habitat, and in many ways you may as well have just gone in and clubbed every one of the koalas on the head. Um, oh, that's just a great point, because, you know, industry is given a permission to, to in, le- in law, to take. And one of the reasons when we briefed the legal team for a Koala Protection Act, we said that no longer exists under our thinking. It says you, industry, have to realise that this species is important. And we did um, model this on the Bald Eagle Act. And I think I've sent you a copy of my book, and in the forward it does say that Rachel Carson in the 1940s was arguing for the protection of the bald eagle in America. But it really wasn't until Pearl Harbor happened that the American government said, you know what, we have to protect this bald eagle. And the Bald Eagle Act came in, it was literally one piece of paper, and it said, you cannot touch its habitat, you cannot touch the bird. And it was nearly 50 years, 1992, when the act was sort of slightly weakened because the the bird had recovered. Now, I feel that the koalas in those dire straits, but of course we haven't got a war But I do think we have climate change, and I think that's the biggest war that any of us will ever fight. I I have just watched my country over the last two weeks or so. We have floods, we have um, cyclonic winds, we've got heat, we've even got cold. You know, nothing seems normal, and I think that everyone on the planet's feeling that. And I do think our political leaders are stuck in um, the temples of mammon, really. They're just looking out the window and not actually feeling it. And, uh, yeah, so I, I feel very concerned that the only future, I think, is that we've got to educate people to be much more aware of their personal lifestyle. And so I continue to constantly try and explain to people, don't waste anything on this planet because it will run out. And if these temperatures continue, I think we're all going to suffer very greatly. So a question that you asked me in... In your note, when I wrote you about that that uh, approval about the mine, you wrote back and you included a question. You said, the question needs to be asked, why approving mm-hmm. all these now when coal prices are low and carbon yeah. is, is a huge issue on the planet? So actually, yeah. I'm going to ask you that question. Why? Why are they approving these? Is it is it simply well, that they're in the pockets of the industry or is there more to it? Oh, I think that... Uh, I think every political leader on the planet's in the pocket of industry, and I think it's worse than it's ever been. Um, And I did actually uh, take advice from a a new age economist that I actually met. I was on a um, uh, a planning assessment commission where one of the big coal mines that actually is from the Chinese government, and it's in major habitats, and that project doesn't have to do anything for koalas, even though it's quite a significant habitat because it's got one of these controlled actions. But, you know, everyone goes through the motions. But I met this man called Tim Buckley, and, um, you know, you might even be interested in interviewing him at some stage because he gave me some briefing documents for this interview. But I don't understand it. You know, I don't think I'm an idiot, but I read it all, and I can see that coal prices have been down, and then they're starting to go up. And I personally think that there's manipulation going on. I think that the players are controlling the amount, the price, and I think while the price is down, everyone goes, oh, my gosh, the jobs aren't going to be here. And so there's this mantra of we have to have jobs. And then we have one huge coal mine that's just been approved and um, or they've got sort of environmental constraints on them and that's a company called Adani and there is huge outcry about that and again when you read the pros and cons of this, this is for India to to um, you know to increase the, the quality of life to the Indian people um, but you just think surely we should be encouraging companies in India to be using renewable energy. And, and I just don't understand. So when I was in America, everyone said coal is dead. But I don't think it is. Otherwise, all these coal mines wouldn't be approved. And, and I would really encourage people to understand, is there such a thing as clean coal? Can you burn this stuff? 
our Prime Minister is constantly saying this, that I can't see anything that says we've now got clean coal technology. You're still just producing. And then you see China saying, well, we're going to move to renewables, but they're one of the biggest clients in our country for coal. So none of it makes sense to me, and I think that's the best I can say at the moment. I think I have to have better advice and better understanding, but I think it comes back to everything I experience in my job, and that is the political leadership at the moment is very short-term thinkers. It's about the next election cycle, and it's certainly about political donations, and I think that has to stop. Right, I, I agree. And a couple of things. One of them is that clean coal is 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 nonsense. It's it's mm-hmm. it's a oxymoron. And the next thing mm-hmm. is. Um, it's the people in the United States who are telling you that coal is dead in the U.S. are, um, I don't know whether the word is optimistic or, or whether it's just they're simply not telling the truth because what's happening is that coal production in the United States is, has gone down a little bit in the last couple of years, but it's mm-hmm. still higher than it was in, say, 1990. And mm-hmm. It's um, what's happening is that coal use in the United States is decreasing some, but the United States is simply exporting the coal. And in, in terms of global warming, it doesn't matter tremendously whether it's burned in Australia, United States, or or China. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't matter at all. So that's yeah. that's all fairly negative. And one more thing I want to say about this is that there's there's a fact about fishing, but it applies here too because this is this is just capitalism at its core, but the world's commercial fishing fleets are subsidized to a value greater than even the econo- the, than the value of the cash. That's not even including, you know, the murder of the oceans. That's just, on an economic yeah. level, it's handing them money. And yes. I'm guessing... And I, 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 believe, I believe you. And the thing is, that's the same as the forestry industry. It's heavily subsidized. And, and over these 30 years, I go into forests and you just see this complete destruction and we sell some of that wood for the price of a cup of coffee, $7 a ton for, for wood that might be 500 years old. And I just find it... One scientist I spoke to in readiness for this, we just both agreed that it's sort of like... They just, there's no thought, you know, and, and I think Australia actually is quite naive because we've only got 24 million people and everybody can see their little bit of the patch. You can go into some of these forests and they look huge and it still is huge, but they cannot get that 85% of it's gone. They just can't get it. And so they just think, oh, well, I'm allowed to do this. And there's no marketing of how do you t- turn the workers into something else. And that has been shocking to me. Every time I go somewhere, I go, you know, you could be doing this. You could have, you know, the farmers could be having cups of tea and bringing in people and showing them their beautiful farms. Why would you want to cut these trees down? But it's like my dad did it and I'm going to do it. And, uh, oh, Derek, I think if I knew the answer to this, we'd both vibrate into life. It just, it, it, it is... It sounds so hollow to say that our political leaders are short-term thinkers, but I think they are. Well, it's I, I, I've long known that if I were made the, um, you know, if I were put in charge of the entire economy, what I would do is, I mean, of course, capitalism has to be gotten rid of at some point. But in the meantime, mm-hmm. just switch the subsidies so that instead of paying to deforest, you pay to reforest. and. Yes, exactly. And it's just that's uh, exactly. So obvious, but it's it's clearly not happening. Um, well, and also, could I say that the people who do download your podcast, maybe they could email me and give suggestions, because I know where I'm at in my career, and that is over the years I used to come to America and constantly meet with all the big NGOs so that I had solutions for this. But now I know that my, the rest of my career has got to be about getting this legislation. If you have strong legislation that contrain, constrains and controls industry and says you can go about your business as long as you incorporate the environment into it, that will force them into better development. It has to. Developers will just say, you know, if the law is there, I'll sort of meet it. But if there's no laws there, so I, I'm quite content that this is my piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So I, I am confident I will get this, <laughs> come by hook or by crook. Um, 
But I think it's imperative for the young people who come working through the NGOs to really understand what they're up against. I think I spent, I think the last 10 years of my career has really been a massive reality check about how many enemies the koala has. The cutest animal on the planet, but it's got major enemies. And, um, and over the next few years, I intend to expose those enemies and hopefully bring some of them to account. I, I, last year, I went to a, um, a, a seminar where they had Earth Laws Alliance and talked about ecocide, like the word genocide, and I am so excited and inspired by a woman called Dr Polly Higgins in London who is writing the legislation for ecocide so that you can charge companies with the destruction. And I just wish her Godspeed. And, and I can see now that I have watched ecocide over my 30 years and it is just so wrong. And there are no laws to stop them. So the governments treat us all with impunity. But I also really wanted to say to your listeners, it comes back to us. We've got to stop consuming. We've got to stop throwing away stuff. We've got to stop. We've got to start realising that we, as seven billion people, if we all came together and said, you know what, we don't want that energy of yours. We want to do something different. Um, they will listen. We have the power. But in your country recently, you know, you had the lowest voter turnout. And in our country, we have compulsory voting. And you know, I'm proud of Australia for that but I can also see some of our young people see no um, sense in voting. So one million of them haven't even registered to vote. And when I was a young woman, if you did that, you were fine. So I can even see governments are taking the pressure off their citizens because if you don't vote and you're young, they just think you would vote against us because we're conservatives. We have a conservative government right now. So I want to spend the next few years making sure those one million people register and vote for the protection of our forests. Um, if they do nothing else, if they've lost faith in the political system, we have to inspire them that their vote is important. So, so before we talk about the Koala Protection Act, um, can you tell if, if people either A, live in Australia, or B, don't live in Australia, what can they do to oppose the, the mines that you are talking about? Well, I think that um, the best thing for any person to do is the power of the pen, write to our Prime Minister and say, um, we expect you as a nation on this planet to be responsible about how you're going to raise the temperatures that will affect me. That's certainly people who live away. And in Australia, I think the same thing. I think vote for people who, or make it clear to your political leaders you don't agree with what they're doing because more and more the parties are getting more and more tight. This is what we think. You, we're not allowed to speak. And we do have a lot of fractions, factions and fractional um, infighting at the moment. So a lot of people are walking away from the two parties. So in some respects, I do think there's political change coming, but it does seem so much to the right. And I, I just wish that... Uh, and I don't believe they're the people I meet in the bush or, or worldwide. I think all of us want, um, you know, a clean environment, good schooling, good food, clean water for our children. I don't think we're power brokers and mongers, you know. I think we're just voting for somebody else because they're telling us, you know, we're going to lead you out of this. But I, I don't see any governments on this planet right now that have got the vision I would like to see. And I think we, the people, have to convince them we want you to be better. And you, and you have to tell them, this is what I expect of you. So tell me about the Koala Protection Act. Oh, yes, I'm so proud of this. I can't tell you. And it's written. And the, um, the legal team who wrote it rang me one day and said, you know, Deborah, this is just too tough. Do you want to water it down? And I went, no, I don't. So I've sent that to the four leaders of our political parties um, and have asked them to endorse it, and none of them have replied. And that act basically says if your project is on a piece of landscape that has any koala habitat on it, your application is already no, 
until you can prove that your activity is benign to the environment and the koalas. And it is so simple that there's no regulations, there's no what ifs and buts and stuff. It says these trees, a bit like your bald eagle act, the minute you want to destroy that habitat, you have to show cause. And to be frank, how can any industry on this planet right now think that you can go after the remaining 15% of the world's forests? And I really want your listeners to think 85% of the world's forests are already gone. Those trees produce oxygen. They take in CO2. If the trees are gone, then the oceans take it in. You know, this, that's just good science. You know, social studies when you're a child. And I actually wrote that to our Prime Minister. So I think we almost have to write to them as if they're children. Do you, and, and certainly in the last couple of days with this immense heat, my property, because I have so many trees, is six degrees cooler than my neighbours. So plant trees, everyone has to plant trees, and we have to stop any trees being cut down. So you have to chain yourself to them now. You have to say, I will not tolerate you taking that tree down. And that takes a huge amount of courage, but we all have to do that. So, so you've sent, you've, you've, you've written and had a legal team help write the this mm -hmm. act, and then mm -hmm. it's been sent off to the four, the leaders of the four major parties who have so far mm -hmm. not responded. And what is mm -hmm. your next step? What, what, what do the, how do you get from point A of where you are now to point B? of having this at some point um, actually made made into law? What, what is your strategy for doing so? Well, you have to educate the people to tell their local members. I mean, we have 150 people in our parliament, and that means we need 76 of them to say yes to a Koala Protection Act. So I can say that I have an office that does look somewhat like Kevin Spacey's House of Cards, because I do have those 150 people on the wall and you, you just have to gradually encourage them. So on our website, we have a thing called Act or Acts. So we have identified every single one of those 150 people. Do you have koala habitat in your electorate? How many koalas do you have? And do you support the Koala Protection Act? So out of the 127 that are actually physically in the habitat, we haven't had one person say yes yet. Not one. Wow. And, and that's been going on for seven years. But now the Prime Minister only has 76 seats in his parliament. So if anyone died or went to the toilet, he, he potentially loses that. So I'm hoping that Mr Turnbull will understand that he, as custodian of the koala, needs to make those 76 people support our act. And I suppose the more people who write to him and tell him that they want to, and I think it's a numbers game, Derek. You know, politicians only respond to the amount of unrest. And do you, yeah. do you, I mean, obviously the, uh, the um, those in power, the power brokers or whatever we want to call them, um, mm -hmm. are so far not particularly interested in the Quality Protection Act. But do you, do you perceive, do you, do you hear a lot of support for it among normal human beings in Australia? Look, in, um, it, it's probably too hard to explain, but in our country we have a thing called donkey voting, which is, um, it, it is compulsory voting. So, you know, it, it could be five people who are standing for any seat. And Australians historically, just if they don't feel um, that anyone's very good, they'll just go in what we call donkey votes. So you just go one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so when they have a ballot about where you come on the ballot paper, it's called the donkey voting day. So in July of this year, I took a donkey on the road for 6,000 kilometres and encouraged everyone to vote for her or, <laughs> or their local member and encouraged them to draw her ears on the, um, on the ballot box. And I can tell you that... We also took a documentary crew with us and we interviewed the average Australian who was happy to go on a soapbox to tell this beautiful donkey called Matilda um, 
why they felt our political leaders were letting them down, and we're hoping that that will be a documentary sooner than later. We called it Operation Jackass. We drove for six and a half thousand kilometres with a donkey, and if you want to see her website, vote one Matilda. Um, and obviously it was a parody, but I came back from that trip so determined to continue the fight because I can see ecological collapse in my country and the people know it. And they, do, they feel so abandoned that they don't know what to do with their vote. And, um, you know, I'm sure your listeners know that our sort of anthem is Waltzing Matilda. So people would come up to my donkey and go, I'll waltz with you, Matilda. And I feel much inspired about my countrymen. I, I think we are very fed up, and I believe that I have to be a great leader to those people so that I can encourage them to be much more outspoken when they vote. And Matilda certainly has a bit of a taste for this, Derek. She'll be back on the road in our next election in 2019. <laughs> that's great that's great and and what would you what would you um we have like a minute and a half left what would you like for readers for listeners to take away about um koalas forests mines and and life on earth uh i think life on earth is um in serious trouble and I think those of us who have children and grandchildren, and even if you don't, I think you have to really understand that if you don't make a personal change in your life every day, then you just, you can't keep pointing fingers at others. We have to be the change we want to see in the world. And I know that sounds a bit new age, but it's the only way, you know. Um, and, I'm, and I'm glad that I'm the koala woman and I know that, that I love you know, the, the wildlife that I see every day in my life that I cannot bear. I think bravery only comes from feeling the sorrow and I spend a lot of time crying and then once I've cried, then I get braver and I am privileged to be on your radio program, Derek. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you. And, and I spend a lot of time crying too and then get back up and get back in the fight. And um, Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I would yeah. like to thank you so much for your work. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Deborah Tabart. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>